Hello, I'm Grace White. We've been following the Natasha Ashley cold case for years. The 19 year old's body was discovered in 1992, burned to death in the back of her own car in San Jacinto County. It's always been investigated as a murder, but now there's a new theory. Former Harris County prosecutor Kelly Siegler investigated the case on her show Cold Justice on Oxygen. We sat down with Siegler to talk about her theory, and we spoke to Ashley's brother, who we originally met in 2017 when we profiled the case on our own Missing Pieces series. The night she ends up being last seen, there's a party. There's a new episode of Cold Justice that's bringing an old case back in the headlines. She was a popular girl, everybody liked her. 19 year old Natasha Ashley was a cheerleader found burned to death in her car in San Jacinto County in 1992. And in the show, former Harris County prosecutor Kelly Siegler introduces a new theory. I think that it was a horribly tragic accident seems like a big leap to go from murder investigation to accidental death. As a former prosecutor, how do you prove it? Well, you can't exactly prove it, and I think the crazy thing is no one saw it coming. I mean, we opened this case up because we thought we were going to try and solve a murder case. But Siegler says after reviewing the complete case file and interviewing witnesses, they couldn't prove anyone else was involved. She thinks Natasha left the party by herself and was high when her car got stuck. So you think Natasha crawled into the backseat, the hatch area, and that's where she died? I think that whatever was going through her mind that night, whatever was happening in her mind in that car that night, caused her to panic or freak out and try to get away or get out. But there was one question Siegler says she wasn't able to answer. I don't know what started the fire. I wish to God that we could say what started that fire. She says the lab that came up with the drip gas theory, meaning some kind of accelerant siphoned off nearby oil wells was used, wasn't able to be corroborated because the lab is no longer in business. Once you've seen your sister's burned remains, no, you never forget that. We interviewed Natasha's brother, Chad Woodard, on our own Missing Pieces series in 2017. You must be Chad. He was also interviewed on Cold Justice, but says the results of their investigation investigation were something he never expected. But I just can't believe that that's what happened. There's too many other unexplained things. He believes someone set his sister's car on fire. Had that car burned at a natural burn temperature, I could accept that, but it didn't. There had to have been another substance in the car. And he doesn't buy the theory that the car got stuck. We lived up a much rougher road, uphill that Trans Ams and Camaros made it up on the daily. But he's thankful his sister's case file was reopened because he's not giving up. But do I want justice? Yes. Will I continue to fight for that? Yes. There's a lot more to the story, and we have an extended interview with Kelly Siegler. She talks about the time she spent working the case and walks us through in more detail how she came to her theory that Natasha Ashley's death was a tragic accident. Here's our conversation. How did you first hear about Natasha Ashley's case? I've always known about Natasha's case because back when it happened 30 years ago, I was at the DA's office and I remember following the story in the news. And as the years went on, you know, keeping up with it that way. And eventually at some point you realize when you live here, it's the biggest case around here that we all know about that seems to have never been solved. So it was always in the back of my mind as a case that I would love to work on. What stands out to you about Natasha? Her. I mean, she was me. She was you, right? She went to a high school just like we all did. She was a cheerleader. She was popular. She liked to play and party and have fun. Uh, she was about to go off to college. She was just getting her first apartment. She was working at Dairy Queen. She was kind of wild and crazy, but everybody liked her, everybody knew her. I mean, she's every girl that we grew up with, she's every one of us. And she goes to a party one night, drinks too much, does some drugs, okay, and ends up dead. And nobody that's her friend at this party or anywhere involved can say what happened. That doesn't happen. That's crazy. When you first started investigating it, did you think, we're going to solve this? 
I know I wanted to because I realized that if we took it on and start all this up again, and I was working the case because of the new sheriff, Greg Capers, that I know, and because of Todd Dillon and Rob Freyer that I know, that we were going to get people's hopes up. You know, I was afraid to meet Natasha's family, her brother, because I didn't want to get his hopes up. You know, we stir all this up again, and then at the end, we can't say what happened. We don't know who did it, and it was all for nothing. So the pressure was kind of high. What do you think happened to Natasha? I think that it was a horribly tragic accident, and I think that that night she was way more messed up than maybe her friends wanted to describe back then. And I think that being on LSD and huffing and drinking a bottle of Crown and smoking marijuana will do a lot to your brain. And she was in a mood that night. She left, spun out of that party, crazy mad about no one knew what. And she takes off and she misses her turn and she gets herself stuck in her low riding Camaro and she's probably pretty worked up to say the least. And her windows won't roll down and she can't get out of the car because the door won't open. And I don't know what started the fire. I wish to God that we could say what started that fire. But we know that in that car was a bottle of hairspray, a can of hairspray. She was a cigarette smoker. Everybody knew that. Um, accelerant was detected in the front passenger seat. Was there a cigarette lighter? I can't remember right now. But there were, we tried to figure out what in that car could have started the fire. We also visited the theory that a lot of people have thought of, and thanks to all those people that rode in, that when you're in a car of that make and model, and it's that type of car, and you're gunning it and gunning it and stuck, and you're hitting against mud or water or, or stuck, it can start a fire and the catalytic converter can easily start that fire. One guy, one mechanic even told me something about the overheating causing the carpet and the lining of the car to catch on fire. So all these mechanics have written in going, hey, didn't you know that in this kind of car it easily starts a fire? And I would say, yeah, we did. But what's crazy is that back then when Natasha got stuck and the fire started and she ends up being incinerated in the back trunk of her car, What's crazy is that the very next day, it was immediately towed. So when the car is examined and inspected and you see those pictures of the car, that's at the tow truck yard, not where the, where the car was stuck, not out there close to the party. And when that car was towed, as the record driver was towing it down 59 that next day to his yard, it caught on fire again on his tow truck. And he had to pull over and put out the fire again on the car on his trailer and then take it to his yard. So there's all these intervening factors that also happened that messed up the evidence that just changes the whole ability to critically examine the crime scene. So how do you know the car got stuck if the car was towed from the crime scene? Well, you have the statement from the record driver who's passed away. That's why he's not in the episode. Uh, you have his statement and you have the statements from the deputy that made the scene and one other person who made the scene. And they did go back the next day to take a look at where the car had been, and there were some pictures of the hole then, the muddy hole where she had been stuck. It seems like a big leap to go from murder investigation to accidental death. As a former prosecutor, how do you prove it? Well, you can't exactly prove it, and I think the crazy thing is no one saw it coming. I mean, we opened this case up because we thought we were going to try and solve a murder case. And I thought in the beginning it's going to have to be somebody at the party because that's what makes sense unless Natasha just happened on some really sick people as she drove, over, drove away that one or two in the morning night. And they killed her that efficiently and they've never talked, we've never heard anything and no other stories ever surfaced about it. So the idea that at the end of the investigation all signs pointed to the fact that this wasn't even a murder. None of us saw it coming. Talk to us about drip gas. What is it? How did it enter into the investigation? And how did you rule it out? Drip gas, I've never heard it called that before, but I'm kind of familiar with it because I grew up in Matagorda County, and there were wells just like the one, or tanks just like the one that was pointed out to us 
all around Matagorda County or in Southeast Texas. So the drip gas theory in Natasha's case comes by way of one of the officers from the Sheriff's Department asking a private lab back 30 years ago out of the Dallas-Fort Worth area to, to analyze some, some articles recovered from the car. So it wasn't a DPS lab, it was a private lab. I've never heard of anyone using that lab before. Uh, the people that own that lab, run that lab, are no longer here that we can talk with about what they saw. And the lab report itself, calling this drip gas, or what it actually says is consistent with drip gas, that's what it says. And they don't even call it drip gas in the report. Um, is inconsistent. So the report to me didn't even make any sense. And one part it says consistent with drip gas and in one part it says consistent with gasoline. And there was no one that I could ask what does that mean reconcile this inconsistency for me. There's no one to talk to about that. So we tried to do it the common sense way or the civilian witness way. How do we get to this drip gas idea? And no one, no one from Natasha's world had any idea about how drip gas would get in the front seat of her car with windows rolled up and unable to be rolled down. How does that happen? I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I don't know. I do know that trying to introduce evidence in a courtroom today admissibly of the theory of drip gas would be pretty impossible to do. So you think Natasha crawled into the back seat, the hatch area, and that's where she died? I think that whatever was going through her mind that night, whatever was happening in her mind in that car that night, caused her to panic or freak out and try to get away or get out because she couldn't get her doors open. They were, they were um, low centered. And she called and maybe crawled into the back to try and unhook the latch, but there wasn't one, or kick it open, but she couldn't. And then the fumes got to her and it didn't take very long for that to happen. How did you rule out all the rumors that anyone else started that fire? Well, we went through the rumors one by one, and every single rumor that we could think of from, from the case file, from the offense report, from witnesses, from podcasters, and from the book that has been written, we put up on the board. And we went down the road of checking into each of those rumors as long and far and hard as we could to see if there was anything of substance to those rumors. And most of them were pretty were eliminated pretty easily. Is there any doubt in your mind that this was an accidental death? No. No, there isn't. There isn't. And I think it's a horrible tragedy that so many people have had to live their whole life under the shadow of this blame. But everybody wanted to, to think it was a murder, I think because of the horrible way her body was found. You see that and you, you think about the horror of seeing your daughter's bones in the back seat of her own car and you just jump to murder, but you don't start from the beginning and that was what was lost all these years. Have you ever had another case end up like this? No, and I never will again. I don't think that this happens more than once to you in a lifetime of looking at murder cases. What do you tell the people that say, no way, this, this is murder, this wasn't an accidental death? I think we all acknowledge going in that when we thought we were going to find a murderer, someone out there was going to say, you have the wrong person. Because everybody has their very locked in theories of what happened. Everybody thinks that they know. And I would say to all those people, all those people, even the ones in law enforcement, you have not read every word of that huge file like we did. And if you did, and if you could, and if you had, you would have a whole different story and take on this case. We called the San Jacinto County Sheriff's Office and the DA's office. Both told us they are not closing the Natasha Ashley case. Sheriff Greg Capers told us we are always open to new evidence, and the DA's office said they encourage anyone with new information to come forward.